Hey guys, welcome back. So whether you guys are at home thinking about selling a home and want to give yourself some curb appeal to the house, or you've just bought a home and you don't like what, what's there and want to give it some curb appeal, or whether you've been there five or 10 years and it just needs a facelift, that's what this video is about. So it's going to be about curb appeal, making the front of your house really pop. This is obviously a home we're going to be landscaping. This probably could be maybe a builder special that they'd put in, but we're going to definitely give this thing even a bigger spruce up. So this home actually has really good bones. So you basically look at this. I love the way this home is done. My wife would always love to have a brick home. If we ever purchase another home, it'll be a brick home. So the brick itself actually really pops very well. And so we always have to keep these things in mind. You've got two columns here, three technically. You've got windows. There's the windows are the eyes of the home. And whatever you do, like in the makeup world, you're going to accent around those eyes. Same thing in the landscape world. So we're not going to ever put something that's going to be something ginormous that's going to block that window. Now we do in certain situations. Um, a homeowner has like that front home, that front window um, they've turned into um, their office during COVID. Um, and basically when, when doing that, um, the sun sets or rises on one side and it just bakes the home. There's certain situations where we do it for functionality, but for curb appeal purposes, we're always gonna to try to leave that open. So the previous landscaper that would have put this in, I think did a fairly good job. They didn't put the tree right directly in front of the, in front of the window. There's nothing too, too large that's going in, um, but we are gonna go ahead, you'll actually see this at the end, this entire landscape's getting completely gutted. We always factor in when doing so, because we're gonna, it's gonna take a lot to get these bushes out. We factor in even a little bit of grass just in case. Well, I think we're also gonna be shaping the bed a little bit differently. Um, but going back to this, so when you're doing um, landscapes at home, the first thing I always consider are your windows, columns, walkways because all these things really matter. We don't want to just have a solid bush that goes in front of this entire thing. We're going to break it up a little bit. These columns are pretty special. So we're actually going to put, I think, a couple blue point junipers to the right and left here. They're going to give um, this more columnar look that's going to go with what's going on here. And then a little space between that and then start an actual hedge of material. Okay, so that hedge is going to wrap around. We're going to be doing a podocarpus. The pineapple guava that's here currently, which is actually a pretty cool bush, if you're able to put it somewhere where it can get bigger, it actually will, this one will produce guava that you can eat. Basically, this hedge, it's going to grow a lot faster. So you have the option of keeping it a little bit tighter so it never gets any taller than those windowsills. The fact that this windowsill is about thigh height. So whatever you're doing plant-wise, we want to try to make sure we're not going any higher than that. You can let it get higher. It's a personal preference type thing, but we're always in our minds aiming to try to keep it at that windowsill height and not get any taller. Everything tapers and lowers down from there. So we're going to be doing, I actually saw this morning, we didn't get to film it. We saw, I don't know what the heck he was after, uh, but we saw this little um, um, hummingbird that was flying around, but we will be doing a hummingbird attractor called a dwarf bottle brush. So we're gonna be doing a dark green hedge. A lot of people get fixated, uh, a lot of homeowners that are do-it-yourselfers get fixated on doing lots of flowers because that's gonna bring lots of color from the home and that is what they think is going to make the most attractive front of the home. For homeowners that don't mind being in the garden a lot, that's a great option but you can actually create with lots of evergreen material, you can create a landscape that's very easy to sustain um, if you're gonna do your own maintenance at home. So you're gonna cut your yard, pull, pull weeds, trim hedges. You can do it with evergreens and not have as much work. And that's what we're gonna be doing here. And we're gonna be doing colors, lots of colors with the evergreens. So our first hedge, or I guess our first thing that goes into the blue point juniper, this plant's gonna have this really neat um, blue green color. Right next to that, running along here, is gonna be a dark green podocarpus. So that dark green against that blue looks really nice. And then in front of it is gonna be a light green bush that has red flowers. And the dwarf bottle brush blooms at least three times a year here in Jacksonville, Florida, or more sometimes. So that's gonna have a little different accent with the color, and that's gonna kind of wrap around. We're gonna continue that. So another thing is, you guys at home, you may want symmetry, you may not want symmetry, so you may want it not symmetrical. We always just try to focus on having balance in the yard. If you're a symmetrical person, certain homes can lend itself to it. A home like this, you can do things pretty symmetrical. Certain homes can't, but you can always create balance. One of those things that we create balance with is you might only have five bottle brush on this side and three on this side, but if, as long as we continue it on this side, you're now continuing it and it has a purpose that basically flows throughout the yard. But there are some azaleas on the property that aren't in the right place, but they're great. They love them. So we're going to use those and transplant them along this side of the wall. That's going to be helpful in the landscape. So we're going to have some of those dark greens going down to that bottle brush. And then in front of that, 
we're doing a variegated and variegated is just basically, you can sometimes have it like white green, yellow green, but it's just a variegation that runs through most of the plants. And this one's gonna be an Aztec grass. So there's gonna be an Aztec grass that's a small border grass that goes between. Uh, it's the third row, because um, this bed is actually somewhere around probably 12 feet deep. So you can actually get four, um, four rows of different plants in a, in a bed space like this. So the Aztec grass is gonna go as its third layer. And then in front of that is a ground cover um, flowering plant, blew my mind. So going backwards and thinking about this, we're gonna have this really cool blue and red flowering theme in throughout this landscape um, with lots of different colors um, in the, the plant material. Because what you see right now is you got the pineapple guava, has kind of a light green color, but everything else, it's, it's very green. And I'm guessing that's why we got called out here, right? This is actually not one of my jobs, Alicia. One of our designers actually designed this one and sold this, but that would probably be a good assumption is it's a lot of green and it's just a lot of basic green. So we're gonna do similar to what they've done here with evergreens, but we're mixing it up. We're just choosing the right plants that go with the home for the homeowner, because you could do something totally different if somebody else lived here. Let's jump over for a second. I wanna show you the other side of the yard. So we're gonna continue that look of those blue point junipers and put one right here on the column and they're gonna maintain it. The idea is not to let it get to be this tall thing. We're gonna keep it low. It's gonna be kept low and it's just gonna be this nice framed shrub that's kind of pyramidal shaped. And then on this side, the same thing. So you've got this big old crepe myrtle and I'm gonna to get to that in a second, but we're gonna do the same thing here. On each side of the property, we're gonna be taking out the crepe myrtle. It's a little overbearing on this um, driveway. So the crepe myrtle's coming out and so is the uh, holly tree on the far left of the property. And the homeowners here like the little gem magnolias. So we're gonna be putting in some little gem magnolias to the right and left. Something that they, they love and enjoy. I'm guessing they love those white flowers on them. So an evergreen. And that might be another reason that they like it as well. And just know guys, there's so many options. So this is more of an evergreen traditional, depending on where you live, depending on your styles and likes. These things can be replaced. You know, if you lived at the beach, instead of a juniper, you could be doing a Hawaiian tie in those sections, right? You could do a croton that gives you some color in those areas. Those are all substitutable type things. We've, I'm going backwards for a second, we've talked about this. So those, those windows, those columns, those are things where you wanna kind of create some height. The other thing you wanna do on a lot of homes, and it was attempted with the crepe myrtle. And honestly, if the crepe myrtle was just maintained in a little different way, what it looks like is, we call it crepe murder. It looks like this tree has been crepe murdered quite a few times. It's been chopped back at the same spot over and over. If this tree was allowed to grow like the crepe myrtle wanted to in this situation, the canopy would be up and above. And maybe at that point we wouldn't need to do that. Um, but the way it's been trimmed is just, it's just the way it's been trimmed. A lot of people do that. So the magnolias are going to be allowed to grow up. It is really nice to have something. If you're into more of that tropical look, do a couple queen palms, one on the far right, one on the far left. Um, there's not enough room on this property to do a robolini somewhere in the middle. You maybe be able to do two, two trunks on the, the outer wall there. But if you're into that tropical look, you do something like that. But it is really nice to frame the home. It really kind of defines the home, having something big on those corners, if at all possible. Now, it's all completely different if you're doing more of a contemporary, very sleek look. You wouldn't do that at all. That, you know, you, you really want it to be more clean. So these curvature things can change so much. The last thing on the home that I'm always looking at is any obstacles that are outside for peripheral purposes. So I have this exact same box at my home. I regret the bush I put in over the years. I have the viburnum. I have these typical viburnum that everybody has seen in the past, Ototisserum. So it's a sweet viburnum. And this thing meant to get like 12, 15 feet tall. So, you know, the bush just gets so stinking large and then I gotta kind of cut it back. I wish I would have done what Alicia is doing around this box and that is the podocarpus. So um, this podocarpus, we're gonna trim a little bit higher. It's just easier over time. Once it gets a certain height, you can maintain a lot easier. But I believe what she's gonna be doing is she might be surrounding the whole thing if the neighbors, neighbors are cool with it. I don't know if you can see it, John, but there's that hummingbird on the salvia way over there. Can you see it? That's that same, oh, there he goes. That was that same hummingbird. So that's, he was here for this, he was here for that salvia. Um, and it's cool because we're gonna be adding more stuff. So that guy's gonna have some more food after we're done here this week. Um, all right, so podocarpus. So the podocarpus, what I did at my home, I didn't ask my neighbor and I should have, but I just started here and did a horseshoe shape bed around this guy. So when I drive home now, when my peripheral, when I'm coming home, when you pull up, when you pull up to the driveway, you don't see that box. It's an eyesore, right? So it's great to kind of get rid of that guy. And you make a little plant bed around it. Super, super simple. 
we offer a lot of services, right? So we do a lot of different things. Our company is a full encompassed landscape company. Can't say that about a lot of companies and it's not, you know, it's not for everybody, but we actually provide design and installation of all landscapes, pavers. You want your driveway tore out, we'll do that. We do a lot. Uh, we also afterwards maintain it. We have the garden center, you can come shop. So we put everything in and we got a little bed of annuals. Well, you can come swap those out yourself and do that part of it. We do it the first time and you take it over from there. Because we do so many things, I also like to talk about not just the general, what the curb appeal is, right? I think we covered that pretty well but just some of the things to be doing. So if you're gonna do this yourself, and, and honestly, if you're, we're doing it, if you're interested to know, you know, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna get in here. So I'm not sure who the crew is today that's coming out, but they're gonna come out here and they're gonna gut everything, right? So we may damage a little grass. We always factor that, like I said, but the two bigger things are gonna be this holly tree and that crepe myrtle getting that out. So obviously we're gonna come with a machine and dig this guy out. There is a locate company you call. I think it's 411 you don't know what the heck's gonna be underneath this, right? So you could have a main line going to home, sewage coming out, that can be one of your biggest challenges. And for a homeowner getting this out, this can be a pain in the butt. It's possible. Um, you probably have to kind of chop it up and dig the root ball and spend pretty much a day doing it. We obviously have the right machinery. The guys will have it out in an hour or two. If we were transplanting it, it would maybe take more like four hours because we have to do a lot more to it. So when you're digging this out, you have to basically come in here and you have to dig a hole, uh, I'm sorry, a trench, roughly three or four feet. It depends how big the tree is. I'm looking at the canopy here. So I'm gonna probably dig a trench about one foot wide, two feet deep, right along this entire circle. And then I'm gonna come in and I'm either gonna strap it and pull it out or I'm gonna fork it and pull it out um, and do that. Now we always start digging this by hand. So even though we have machinery, this has to get dug by hand and we do that intentionally so we can find any main lines and stuff. So every single home, I'm not sure where it's gonna be on this home. So nothing down this side, it's probably the other side. So you're gonna have Comcast, AT&T, you're gonna have your sewage, water, all those things. Well, there's no locate. So you'll notice we have all these orange flags and paint on the ground. Well, this is the company we call to locate things for us in the front yards. So as of right now, we're seeing our underground utilities. And there it is, yeah. So John, you can kind of see that flag on that far side. So the personal homeowner's internet service phone uh, TV is coming up the right side. And so we have to be very cautious. That's the one thing that breaks the easiest on every single property when you're doing this. Just know that in Jacksonville, Florida, Comcast, AT&T, those wires are this deep underneath the sod that you're gonna cut it so stinking easily. So we as Earthworks, we typically on almost all homes, unless it's not in the way, that might be in the way. So what they'll do when they first get out here is they're gonna actually find the line attached to the home and they're gonna dig it up all the way out past where we're doing any work. These lines you see here, these are more of um, main trunk lines and these are gonna be, I think a minimum of two feet deep or deeper in these sections. And so luckily we're not working in this area so we don't have to worry about it. But what I was gonna point out is every home in Jacksonville is almost every home, if you're on the JEA system, it's gonna have a meter. So I've got the neighbor sitting there, ours here. Here's an AT&T box, probably Comcast. So this is all their fiber that runs here, the trunk lines. And then there's also probably a shallow line that runs through this area underneath the driveway and up through there. So you gotta kinda know what you're getting into with those kind of things before, because that, that can really create lots of problems. Comcast is not very happy when you cut their line and you'll not be very happy when your kids can't watch, um, I'm so out of date, sorry, Dora. I don't know, Dora's not even probably a thing anymore. But the other thing is these are, your, these, are, these are your water lines to your home. So you're gonna have the neighbor's water run up somewhere, which you know in certain situations you better be careful, and then your water. So our homeowner's water comes right from here and my best guess is it's gonna run straight through here, but you gotta find the entry point, right? So usually there'll be some sort of valve box or something along here, or the pipe will come up and turn into the home. And if you can't find that, you have to assume you don't know where it went. It could have came up, turned, and went across the yard. So, and that's not something that they can locate for you. So they'll locate wires and things like that, but they're not gonna locate your sewer where it comes from the home out. One little tip and trick on that side though, is you can actually do the sewage by just checking it out on the street. You see how they've carved with a grinder, a W into the street, a W into the street. If those boxes ever disappeared, JA would be able to come over and check it out and go, oh, there it is. They grind it in the concrete, you'll never lose it. There should be an S somewhere on the concrete curb as well. Yep, right here. So here's the sewage. The green mark with an S ground into the concrete. 
So this is where the sewage enters underneath the street from their home. So all their showering, bathroom, washing dishes, all ends up underneath the street here. So there's a four inch pipe most likely, that's most likely I say, is gonna run straight up through here and right into the home. So our crew has to be very careful in this section. And then most likely, right in this area, which it looks like it's buried, um, it's always nice to see if you can keep it exposed, but there's gonna be a little four inch pipe with a lid on the top of it. And that's your sewage clean out. So if you ever have a problem where things get backed up, it's the first thing the plumber does. He locates that and he'll fish from here out and make sure this portion is cleaned out. It's one easy way to um, clean your pipes and such. So it's probably here buried under mulch and leaf debris and the crew's gonna have to find it. So you kind of see all these little things you gotta work through, find, and then you can go. If you're too aggressive, you're really gonna rip some stuff out. If for any reason, if this like scares you whatsoever, obviously there's tons of professionals, right? We of course wanna be the company you call, but if I've done anything, whether you're gonna do it yourself, and now you have some extra little tips and tricks about curb appeal and some of the more, you know, actual do it stuff, or you're gonna hire somebody, now you got a little better question. So now, now you know to ask the questions to see what they're gonna do, how they're gonna do it. Um, so you feel like you've gotten the right contractor, whether it's us or not. That's the whole point of this, is just to make sure we're informing you guys out there. Hope this was helpful, and uh, I'll see you guys in the next video.